By 1980, the horror movie craze that would go on to partly define that decade was already in full swing. And while terror of all types was scaring up big money at the box office, the slasher film undoubtedly reigned supreme. With the Halloween and Friday the 13th franchises having recently laid out the blueprints by which all other slashers would follow, then 33-year-old filmmaker Jimmy Houston had his sights set on adding his own twist to the still-evolving genre. A former film professor at the University of Texas, Houston was intelligent and quick on his feet, sporting a large fashionable beard, worn jeans, and cowboy boots, and would use his time spent on university campuses to make a new kind of slasher movie. Houston came with an eclectic filmography and was fresh off the adventure drama Sibo when he again partnered with his longtime creative collaborator, actor and producer Earl Owensby. While Owensby had starred in and produced Houston's first three features, for reasons that are unknown, he would ultimately not be involved or at least not credited. Final Exam would be Houston's first professional screenwriting credit and it was important that his slasher movie prioritize the lives and relationships of the characters over blood and guts. And the enthusiastic filmmaker intentionally molded a slow burn frat house horror movie that defied audience expectations at every turn. For better or worse. For those unfamiliar, the story follows a group of unwitting college students in the last days of finals week where nerds and jocks clash and romance blossoms, all while a faceless killer stalks the school grounds. Standout scenes include the gym sequence which offers a great iconic shot of the killer, a gruesome death, a brilliant if fourth wall breaking scoreboard gag and some world-class body stuffed in a locker acting. The tower climax, which was shot in a very real and very rickety on-campus structure, is also a highlight and really ratchets up the suspense. But for everyone who's seen the film, you're all just waiting for me to talk about that prank scene. It seems inconceivable now that a scene like this could exist in any movie, let alone a horror film and it stands as one of the most head-scratching moments in slasher movie history. What is meant to be a simple diversion is depicted as a mock terrorist attack that would traumatize anyone who had the misfortune of witnessing the guns blasting or the co-conspirators feigning injury. I mean, I'm pretty sure this would have led to an FBI investigation. Three campuses would double for the fictional Lanier College. Limestone University in Gaffney, South Carolina, as well as Isothermal Community College in Spindale, North Carolina, and Gardner-Webb University in Boiling Springs, North Carolina. However, many other scenes, mostly interiors, would be filmed at EO Studios in Shelby, North Carolina, although some of the dorm room interiors would be captured in redecorated abandoned dormitories. Produced and distributed by Motion Picture Marketing, headed by first-time executive producer John L. Shambliss, the budget was set at approximately $363,000, in addition to a few kickbacks from our friends at A1 Steak Sauce and PepsiCo. Although set in late spring, the film was shot in just six weeks from mid-September through October 1980, with most of the crew being friends and associates of Jimmy Houston, including some of his former students, 
many of whom filled in as background characters and extras. For example, Sam Kilman, the on-set dialect coach, would play the town sheriff. All right. And Dolly Grip Jean Poole can be seen as a cafeteria employee. Producer Lon Kerr can also be spotted early on. Excuse me, I'm sorry. It's okay. Due to its limited budget, filming would have to be done fast and cheap, with little time allotted for second takes. And for the film's later half, the cast and crew were forced to work through all hours of the night. Back in 1957, down in North Carolina, they had a legend about a man called Sibo. Sibo <laughs> director of photography Daryl Cathcart would be brought on by Houston, and together they capture the perfect low-budget horror movie aesthetic while offering a few fun and inventive shots along the way. One of my favorites is the shot showing the killer's legs as he is being lowered on the dumbwaiter down into the kitchen. According to the cast, the film was reportedly shot, more or less, in chronological order. Although filmed on the East Coast, casting would take place in Los Angeles in summer 1980, most actors coming from a background in theater and making their feature film debuts. At just 18 years old, Cecile Baghdadi was fresh out of high school when she won the role of Courtney, our classic studious final girl. As the final girl, Courtney is often assumed to be the primary protagonist, but in my eyes, she is given so much less to do than our supporting characters that her emergence as such almost comes as a surprise. You know, some people have it so much easier. And really, she only becomes the fabled figure by process of elimination. According to Baghdadi, the filmmakers were so impressed with her ability to scream that her shrieks were used to dub over actor Carol Kapka's screams in the opening scene, where Kapka plays our first female victim. Hi. Hi. In his first professional audition, Boston native Joel S. Rice would beat out five other finalists for the fan-favorite role of Radish, and after which permanently relocated to Los Angeles. I'm sure I'm not the only one to point out that Radish checks many of the boxes of the final girl, being a presumed virgin bookworm that gets a large amount of screen time. One of my favorites. Alas, it wasn't meant to be. There is no free brunch. The character has been cited as the inspiration for the horror movie-obsessed Randy Meeks from Wes Craven's Scream Saga. Radish also acting as this film's doomsayer Senseless murders are a modern phenomenon. and showing an interest in horror cinema, albeit much more subtly. Additionally, the character is often considered to be the first take on the nerdy friend horror movie trope. According to Rice, he and co-star Cecile Baghdadi were under contract by the studio to return for as many as two potential sequels. Deanna Robbins would be cast as Lisa, our stock vixen character, a willingness to film nude being a prerequisite for the role. While the film isn't overly sexual, Lisa seems to exist purely to check that box, and Robbins plays it fairly well. You'll never catch me studying chemistry. The character also receiving one of the film's bloodier demises. <laughs> Sherry Willis Birch nabbed the part of Janet because she was already a temp employee at Motion Picture Marketing, and when higher ups learned that she was also a theater major at UCLA, they handed her the role. Well, it isn't like it's the first time, Gary. However, for her work on the film, Willis Birch would only be compensated her meager temp salary while her co-stars received payouts as high as $500 per week. To fill out the frat boys, John Fallon would win the role of frat leader Mark. I mean, just look at that head of hair. Well, I told him to make it look good. <sighs> and Terry W. Farron would be cast as their misfortunate pledge, Gary who infamously racks up a chunk of screen time in his tidy whities while tied to a tree. The folksy campus security guard who takes it upon himself to pour booze down his underpants was actually just a local resident hired by Houston due to his eccentric personality. You know good and well that I'm holding up my end. 
Ralph Brown took on the memorable role of Wildman, the obnoxious meathead bully being a sacred 80s slasher movie staple. I can't help it because I'm offensive. However, a horrible miscalculation during the filming of Wildman's weighty death scene led to the actor being nearly killed. According to co-star and fight coordinator Tim Rayner, during an unplanned shot, the machine cable suddenly tightened around Brown's neck and choked him into unconsciousness, Rayner having to resuscitate the actor in front of crew. Thankfully, Brown escaped with minimal damage. It's also worth noting that Final Exam would be the one and only film that all three of these actors would ever appear in. Stand-up comedian Don Hempner plays the salacious Dr. Reynolds, being a good friend of Jimmy Houston's. I don't know if there's a deleted scene out there, but I do find it odd that Reynolds isn't killed off, given that his bad behavior is set up early in the film but never pays off. I love the sweet young girls that throw themselves at me. <laughs> also, I love that Lisa keeps a publicity-style photo of him on her dresser. Famous bootlegger and stunt performer Elijah Perry would be cast as the coach, here credited under his pseudonym, Jerry Rushing. Perry was also the inspiration for the popular television character Bo Duke in The Dukes of Hazard, and came trained in archery. Unfortunately, Perry would also be injured while filming his death scene when he fell back from the tower stairs and dislocated his shoulder upon landing. I thought it was pretty funny myself, didn't you? <laughs> Actor, stuntman, and all-around badass Timothy L. Rayner would be recommended to Jimmy Houston as a strong candidate to play his killer, a role with no dialogue and limited screen presence, leading to Rayner's first film audition. A naval veteran, Rayner came with a background in live stunt performances, and arrived at his audition donning a three-piece suit and carrying a small arsenal of weapons. While unenamored with his initial pitch, Rayner ultimately won Houston and the producers over after demonstrating his martial arts capabilities on a volunteer crew member. Rayner was well-trained in weapons handling, and has claimed that the knife he wields on screen was an actual razor-sharp chef's knife. What's more, the shot showing the killer catch the coach's arrow was no special effect. Rayner suggested the stunt himself, although he had never done it before, and was only able to practice the scene on the day of filming, but managed to catch it five out of seven takes. At his insistence, Cecile Baghdadi would also beat Rayner with a real wooden beam before he made one hell of a fall. As the fight coordinator, Rayner also choreographed each of the characters' death scenes, almost all main players required to perform their own stunts. Fun facts! Caro corn syrup and red food coloring were used to make the film's sparse blood splatter, a common technique at the time, and the squishy stabbing sounds were made by hacking at a watermelon. In the film's final scene, Courtney turns the knife against the killer. But on the day of shooting, Cecile Baghdadi was actually just stabbing a pillow. <laughs> Prolific film and television composer Gary S. Scott would earn his first professional credit for the music of Final Exam. Although frequently compared to John Carpenter's Halloween theme, and the similarities are undeniably there, Scott crafts a genre-perfect spine-tingling score which relies mostly on piano and synth instruments. Somewhat surprisingly, an official vinyl LP would hit record stores in 1981 from AEI Records that featured the film's complete soundtrack. However, it has never been re-released and is now considered a collector's item. As was common for the slasher business at the time, Houston and the producers would have to go head-to-head -head with the MPAA, who initially slapped the film with an unmarketable X rating. To appease the board, Houston and editor John A. O'Connor cut the number of visible stabbings from 18 down to 12, and the film was therefore re-approved with a much more lucrative R rating. 
Remnants of these lost moments can still be found in the film, however. For example, the killer can briefly be spotted with a knife in his leg while chasing Courtney through the kitchen, although the shot showing how it got there was removed. At Lanier College, they have the finest security, the best teacher-student relations. No fraternity hazing. Strictly enforced curfews. Shh. What was that? And a killer. Premiering on February 27, 1981, early showings were limited to Dayton, Ohio and St. Louis, Missouri. But the film later opened in Los Angeles on June 5th before going wide in the U.S. over the summer, eventually climbing as high as the number seven spot atop the box office and raking in a total of $1.3 million domestically. Final exam. He's come back. Not much was done to promote the film outside of its one-sheet poster and trailer. However, it was the 1980s after all, and just about everything received a novelization. And believe it or not, Final Exam would be no exception. Motion Picture Marketing and Publisher Pinnacle Books commissioned writer Jeffrey Meyer with penning the adaptation, which hit bookshelves on April 30, 1981 in the form of a mass-market paperback. Meyer primarily expanded upon character backstories, even for minor players. For example, the doomed young couple seen in the film's opening are given names for the first time, Dana and John. And the novel also hints at the killer's motivation, which is, of course, totally absent in the film. Sadly, the novel has long been out of print and ended up being Jeffrey Meyer's one and only published work. Despite being a relative success for the studio, Final Exam would be met with a predominantly negative critical response. Its obvious parallels to the Halloween and Friday the 13th film franchises often used to paint the story as derivative and lazy. Although in other instances, this was a positive comparison. However, most saw it as a cheap and artless cash grab and audiences too were left puzzled as to why the killer was given no backstory, no motivation, and really, no unique identity of his own, unless you consider his lack of identity to be his most identifying feature. The police have raided many video shops in the past months. In this North London shop, for instance, they took away the so-called nasty videos, but they left behind... The, the film would arrive in the UK at the peak of the so-called video nasty panic and was consequently seized by the government shortly after, authorities claiming it was in violation of Section 3 of the UK's infamous Obscene Publications Act. Even in the US, Final Exam would be caught in the firestorm that was the increasing social backlash to a newfound bloodthirst among younger audiences, which resulted in cast and crew often having to defend the film against pearl-clutching detractors. It's happening. The psychopaths are here. Movies on video cassette. Enjoy the best for last from the library of the future. In late 1982, the film would enter the quickly growing home video market in the form of a clamshell Betamax from Embassy Home Entertainment, which was first released in Australia. The following year, Embassy would premiere a more widely available slipcase VHS edition in the United States, and the film would see further releases in the format worldwide. It would make its DVD debut from BCI Entertainment in September 2008, and again saw a DVD release from boutique distributor Scorpion Releasing in 2011. However, it would at last land on Blu-ray in May 2014 from Scream Factory, which offered bonus material for the first time, including a cast commentary, exclusive interviews, and more. In April 2023, it arrived on the Ultra HD market as a limited slipcover 4K Blu-ray from Dark Force Entertainment, which showcased an all-new scan from the original 35mm camera negative. While I have not seen this version myself, Dark Force claims it is the best the film has ever looked. It's fair to say that Houston doesn't totally succeed in realizing his vision of a seemingly random and faceless killer. And so at first glance, 
final exam can feel pretty empty. The characters, while likable, exist only to be killed off, and their collegiate antics quickly grow tired, and so the story ends up meandering for nearly an hour before the thrills finally kick in. But let's be honest, the thrills aren't all that thrilling either. And with that being said, I love this movie. I can't believe you said that. Final Exam is as pure and refined as slasher cinema gets, right down to the film grain. Its simplicity and pointlessness is the point. Its relatively tame kills and filler-heavy front end are its main draw. It exemplifies the 80s slasher movie like no other, a near dictionary perfect entry into the genre. In fact, I'd argue that's what most modern mainstream slashers seem to be missing the slow burn buildup and that sense of dreadful complacency. And so for the decades following its release, Final Exam was all but forgotten by mainstream audiences, although its influence would be felt long after. If you don't count the sorority-bound Black Christmas, Final Exam is technically the first traditional slasher film to be set against the backdrop of an entire college campus. Although 1981 would see two more college-based slashers in Night School and The Prowler, both films being modest box office successes. Among horror fans, its reputation has certainly improved with time, and today the film is widely regarded as one of the hidden gems of the genre's golden age, a time where a few warm bodies and some guy with a knife was all you needed for a good night at the movies an experience that may not have set out to challenge you in any way, but one that at least managed to make you wonder what could be waiting around the corner, and if you might be next. So tell me what you think of 1981's final exam. Has your opinion of it changed, or do you still feel about the same? And as always, everyone, thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, go ahead and click like below and feel free to share. And don't forget to find me on Patreon at forward slash Leighton Eversol. And of course, if you want to see more videos just like this one, go ahead and click subscribe.